we're really pleased to have uh, Tim Blackburn here to talk to us about his book, The Jewel Box. Um, so a few quick things about Tim. He's, his day job is that he's an expert in invasion biology at UCL, but by night he is a moths and biodiversity enthusiast. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that, uh, those, the night, those nighttime activities. Um, and this led him to write his book, The Jewel Box, which uh, reflects not only his expertise in ecosystems and in biology, but also what one moth trap can teach us about the workings of all nature. So welcome, Tim. Very pleased to have you. And over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Um, thank you uh, to the Linnaean Society for inviting me to speak today. And uh, thank you to all of you um, who have uh, come to listen to me. Um, I will just start out with a quick apology. Um, I managed to contract COVID last week and uh, the cough from that is uh, ongoing. I'm not infectious, but um, I don't sound at my best. So I do apologize if I uh, cough my way through this, uh, this talk this evening. So this, uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about The Jewel Box, um, finally published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a long process, um, writing a book and publishing a book. And the book left my desk probably about nine months ago uh, to go to the publishers for them to do their thing. Uh, and in those nine months, I have been working out how to present this book in a 45 minute talk. It's 90,000 words. Uh, it covers a lot of ground. And finally, I realized that it's just impossible to do that. Uh, so I gave up. So what I'm gonna do today um, instead of attempting to sort of pracy the whole thing, uh, is to give you a little bit uh, of background to how um, this book came into existence, uh, talk to you a little bit uh, about the aims of the book, what I was hoping to do with it, uh, and then just walk you uh, very briefly through uh, the structure uh, of the contents. So I'm afraid if you want to know exactly what the book says, um, obviously you'll have to go and read it. So let's uh, kick off with the uh, with Genesis, um, where all all good books start. So, I guess the the real uh, starting point from this book was around about seven years ago, um, seven years ago last week, as it happens, uh, when, as part of my job at UCL, um, I was asked to take over running their second year ecology field course. Uh, as the person who'd previously been running it had uh, got a job in Ireland and, and was leaving for, for Pastors New. And this field course runs in June. Uh, it's been running for a number of years. And when I took it over, it was running at a, a field studies council site called Kindrogan, uh, which is just south of the Cairngorms in Scotland. So it's a really beautiful site. Uh, it's an old Victorian country house. So Queen Victoria stayed here. Uh, it's a lovely old building set in beautiful ground with a walled garden um, by a, a curve in the River Ardle uh, with otters in the river and red squirrels running around um, in the trees um, and all sorts of, of lovely creatures there. And so my job was essentially to take a group of undergraduates uh, and introduce them to uh, some of the biodiversity in this area and also different ways in which we go about sampling uh, nature uh, as a way to start to understand it. So when I took it over, uh, we did stuff on uh, sampling birds, we did some stuff on sampling ground invertebrates, uh, pitfall trapping. Uh, and one of the real joys of my year was, was this field course and getting to go up to this, uh, this wild area of, of the UK and, and introduce students to sort of aspects of biodiversity that they um, hadn't known about before. But one of the things um, about Kindrogan was that they had a moth trap. So the first time I went up, they said, would you like us to run our moth trap? Uh, and I said, yes. So, you know, moth traps were something that had been in my awareness. And thinking back now, it's something that must have I must have seen when I was an undergraduate um, at Manchester back in the 1980s. But I have no no memory at all of, of seeing a moth trap. Uh, but at Kindrogan, the, the staff offered to run it. So I said yes. Um, so for those of you that um, that don't know, um, the, the classic moth trap is essentially a box with a light on top. Uh, and if there's one thing that we all know about moths, it's that they're attracted to lights. Um, they then get a bit dazzled and confused by them and they drop into the box. 
uh, and you can uh, go out the next morning and you can see uh, what uh, animals uh, have been attracted to the light and fallen in. And so that first morning, uh, what, the night up, the morning after the night when the staff at the FSC had run the moth trap, uh, was just an absolute revelation to me. Um, I simply had no idea that there were all these incredible insects um, sort of in the environment around us, just going about their, their lives unseen. I guess like many people, I thought that moths were essentially sort of small brown things, um, sort of not very interesting. Um, but that first morning of moth trapping just completely opened my eyes to the, the wonders of these incredible insects. Uh, their diversity of forms, the colors, the shapes, the incredible camouflage that they uh, they have. Uh, you know, here we have on this stick, we have one of the, a couple of the classic uh, camouflage species. This one is a buff tip, uh, which is a mimic of a broken birch stick, um, but also just a whole range of, of incredible shapes and colors and, and some really sort of large insects as well. So here we have a poplar hawk moth, but uh, the um, Privet hawk moth, you know, in the UK has the wingspan of a small bird. Uh, and this completely opened my eyes in a way that I guess I try to do uh, for the students uh, to this, um, this whole wealth of unseen biodiversity. Um, and this moth trap had essentially conjured all of these amazing insects out of thin air. It was like a magic trip, uh, quite incredible. Of course, you know, the, the field course were only there for a week and then we head back to London. Uh, and I got back to London and uh, I basically spent the the rest of the, you know, the, the next 12 months just looking forward to going back to Kindrogan so that we could run the moth trap again, uh, which we did the following year. And then I went back to London and spent another year uh, waiting to the opportunity to run the moth trap again. And after about three years of this, I was on the train back to London. And it suddenly occurred to me that, well, I don't actually have to wait for a whole year. Um, I could get my own moth trap. Uh, you know, not exactly the fastest, uh, fastest of thinkers, but eventually this thought occurred to me. But of course, you know, I live in London um, and London is maybe not the most promising uh, habitat for biodiversity. Uh, lots of it is concrete and brick. Uh, there's not much in the way of, of natural environment in London. Then uh, this is my outdoor space in London. So we don't have a garden. I just have a little roof terrace. It's not very big. Um, it's about six meters off the ground. So it's, it's up in the air. Uh, it's not the most um, hospitable habitat um, a lot of the year. So, you know, would any moths um, be in the vicinity? London is not short of light sources. So there are lots of other um, places for moths to be attracted to. Would, uh, if I ran a moth trap on this terrace, um, you know, would I get anything at all? But I thought, well, you know, the only, there's only one way to find out, take the plunge, uh, get a moth trap and, and see uh, what happens. Uh, so I did, I got my wife to buy me one for my uh, birthday in, in 2018. Uh, this is that trap, not, I will say, um, in London, um, but this is the very trap. Um, and so when it came, I set it up that first night sort of went to bed and the next morning sort of got up with anticipation to see if there were any moths in the trap at all. Uh, and to my absolute delight and no little surprise, uh, there were the moth trap, even on a roof terrace uh, in the London borough of Camden, will conjure these incredible creatures out of thin air. Uh, and when the conditions are right, uh, the diversity it produces can be really quite amazing. So this is, uh, it's a different uh, trap, but this is uh, on my roof terrace last summer, one of those uh, very hot um, heat wave summer nights when uh, the temperature was still sort of up in the sort of mid to high 20s uh, around about midnight. Um, and that particular night, um, the next morning, I picked more than 500 individual moths out of this little box on the roof terrace. Um, it is quite remarkable uh, what will come. And this is essentially then just sparked an obsession uh, that I have uh, now had for several years and is is just getting uh, sort of more and more um, uh, serious and takes up more and more of my life. Uh, and what it means is that now, um, yeah, so I'm exposed to uh, this fantastic biodiversity. So these are all species that um, I can get on my uh, little roof terrace uh, in Camden. 
uh, all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors, uh, a remarkable diversity of creatures. Uh, and it also means that now whenever I go on holiday, uh, whenever I go anywhere, I want to take the moth trap with me to see uh, what's in the environment uh, where I go. So here I am in Devon, uh, roping my daughter into moth trapping as well. So uh, getting the next generation into uh, appreciating these remarkable creatures. Um, and then also uh, sort of graduating onto uh, traps that don't have to be plugged in so that I can now uh, take them to all sorts of um, habitats um, around the UK to see what the moth trap um, attracts. And so having become completely obsessed uh, with moths and this incredible uh, diversity, um, in the first COVID lockdown in 2020, um, I had a, a random email contact from uh, a person called Claire Conrad. So Claire works for uh, a literary agent called Janklow, and Claire contacted me to say that she'd read some of my writing online. Uh, she thought I could actually write quite well, um, and would I be interested in uh, writing a book? Uh, and I said, yes, it's, it's, it was quite a, a timely call, really. So for a number of years, I'd, um, I'd had this idea about writing a book on ecology for a popular audience. Um, and I said this to Claire, but you know, I've never, never been able to see how to make it work, how to um, make it a, you know, a story that people would be interested in. And Claire said, well, why don't you write it about the moth trap? Uh, and that was uh, what you might call a light bulb moment. As soon as she said that, um, I realised I could see exactly how um, I could tell the story of, um, of ecological diversity as a scientist understands it uh, through the uh, prism of this particular ecological sampling tool, uh, a light trap for moths. And so through Claire and her colleague Will um, at Janklow, um, I was then uh, able to make contact with some uh, fantastic editors and publishers. So uh, Jenny Lord at WNN, my, uh, my British editor, uh, Rebecca Bright at Island Press, um, who uh, edited the uh, American version of the book. And with their help and assistance um, and sort of leading me by the hand, um, I did over about a year and a half uh, write the book that um, is now out and available for people to read. And so that's sort of how um, I come to be in a situation where um, th this book now exists. Um, so I want to move on and talk a little bit about some of the aims that I um, that I wanted to try and do with this book. So I'm an ecologist, I'm an ecological scientist. Um, and, you know, I read a lot of um, popular science, a lot of natural history. Um, to my mind, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of really fantastic writing about the natural world. Uh, but most of it is natural history writing. It's about specific organisms or individual organisms or groups of organisms or locations and what I felt um, there was a a niche for if you like was a book that tried to explain how an ecological scientist or how ecological scientists in general try and understand the natural world how they try and understand how we come to be surrounded um, by an incredible diversity of organisms um, in different forms in different numbers and in different locations um, which essentially is the science of ecology. So ecologists, we want to understand um, what determines the abundance and distribution of organisms. And so that's what I wanted to set out to try and do with this book. Uh, and obviously the moth trap gives us, you know, a, a daily uh, snapshot, if you like, into uh, that biodiversity. So the first night I ran it, um, it produced 28 different species, 82 individuals, you know, so then there's immediate questions about, you know, why is it those numbers? Why is it those species? Could it be more? Could it be less? Is that good? Is that a lot? Is it not a lot? What's going on? What sort of um, processes uh, lead us to be surrounded by uh, diversity in the in the form that we we see it? And obviously, this is kind of, you know, a major uh, a major undertaking really so 
ecologists often, I think, uh, suffer from a bit of what we might call physics envy. So physics is uh, an amazing science that uh, comes up with some really very precise predictions um, about how the, uh, the world and how the universe works, um, which ecologists, I think, uh, feel that, that we can't match. So people often think of ecological science as rather a, a woolly uh, topic. But I think um, if people had an appreciation for what it was that ecologists were trying to explain, um, they wouldn't uh, feel that uh, that physics envy was justified. So to kick off, um, ecologists are interested in trying to understand the diversity of species. So if we just think about species, there's probably a million and a half, something like that, uh, named species uh, that uh, scientists are aware of. Um, and actually of these, around about one in 10 um, is a moth. So there is a, around about 140,000 uh, species of moth. Uh, it should be one in nine, really, because um, when we talk about moths, we tend to exclude the 20,000 species um, of butterfly. Uh, but butterflies really are just a, um, a little subgroup uh, of moths that happen to have taken to flying by day and, and being rather showy. Uh, so, yeah, one in nine species is moth. So even if we just focus on moths, that's still more than 150,000 species um, of organisms to think about. The flip side is that if we do think about moths, if we try and understand moth diversity, we're actually getting an insight into a substantial chunk of all the species with which we share the planet. But the thing is, you know, most species are still unknown. Uh, that one and a half million is really only a small fraction of all the species that we believe are out there. So people have tried to estimate how many species we don't know. Uh, and reasonable estimate well no I say reasonable sort of estimates fall in the range of maybe three million to maybe a hundred million species um, which is a pretty wide range of, of variation realistically uh, for eukaryotes um, species like us um, maybe eight million uh, is not unrealistic and then for prokaryotes the bacteria um, and their relatives um, the range of estimates is even greater. So you can find surprisingly low estimates for how many species of prokaryote there are, maybe 10,000, uh, and also uh, rather high estimates, like maybe a billion. Uh, and partly this is because as eukaryotic, organ eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic organisms ourselves, we maybe find it difficult to try and appreciate what is a species uh, for a prokaryote. And all of these different species, however many they are, these have all found uh, unique ways of living, unique ways of um, making a living uh, in the natural environment. Every one of these one and a half named, uh, one and a half million named species, and however many they are, do things in a different way. So physicists, for example, who have maybe 17 fundamental particles, um, 118 um, basic elements, um, you know, those are tiny numbers. It's, it's, life's easy for physicists. They've got very little to actually um, have to try and explain. For ecologists, it's a whole lot harder. And of course, that's just the species. So all of those species um, are made up of individuals of, of generally some unknown number. So for things like birds, um, we can have a reasonably good um, estimate for how many uh, individuals there are across all of the different species. So in the UK, for example, um, pretty good estimates of breeding birds. We reckon somewhere around 161 uh, million uh, British breeding birds in the UK. Um, across the whole world, estimates of the order of around about 80 odd billion birds worldwide, so maybe about 10 birds for every human on the planet. Um, I think if you put it that way, uh, it doesn't sound that many. Um, but birds is, is a group that we, you know, we know very well. There's lots of uh, mad, obsessive birders who go around counting things. Birds are quite big and easy to see. Um, so we can estimate how many individuals that, that we share uh, the planet with. I should say that every one of those 83 billion birds um, alive at any one time uh, is completely unique and different to every other one of the 83 uh, billion birds. Every individual is different. But of course, that's birds. Um, for insects, um, I've seen estimates that, that perhaps 10 quintillion uh, insects on the planet. Uh, it's a number that is rather difficult to get your head round, but uh, that suggests that maybe 
100 million insects for every breeding bird on the planet. Uh, the thing is, um, it's very difficult to know where this estimate comes from and what it refers to. Is it adult insects? Is it all insects? Uh, I just don't know. Um, but nevertheless, uh, very large numbers uh, of insects. Then we go on to the microorganisms, maybe a billion uh, bacteria in a gram of soil. If you think how much soil there is, how many bacteria uh, that equates to across the planet. And then you can even find uh, estimates for the number of viruses uh, with which we share the planet. So um, if you go onto uh, various virus websites, uh, they suggest that there's maybe um, one times 10 to the 31 viruses on Earth. So one followed by 31 zeros or more than a billion uh, viruses per insect on the planet. Uh, and just to give you some perspective on what that number means, uh, if you stretched out all those viruses end to end, they'd span 100 million light years, uh, which just seems absolutely crazy to me. But I have, in fact, done the maths. And, uh, that, that is uh, not an unreasonable estimate if they really are that many viruses. And of course, all of those individuals and all of those species, they interact with each other. And none of them lives in isolation. Uh, if we just consider moths and if we just consider British moths, um, there's around about two and a half thousand species of, of moth in the UK. Um, I should at this point point out that only two of those are species that will eat your jumpers or your carpets. Uh, so the vast majority of, of British moths don't eat your things uh, and do fantastic things uh, in ecosystems. But even amongst just British moths, there's more potential combinations of species living together in communities than there are atoms in the universe. So, you know, the, the things that ecologists are trying to explain, uh, the diversity of species, is just really mind-mendingly enormous. And of course, every second uh, that the planet revolves, uh, some of those individuals are die, new, die, new individuals are born individuals move from place to place. And they've been doing that for uh, 4 billion years or 126 um, million billion seconds. The picture that we try and explain changes constantly. And to understand the diversity of life that we, we see with us today, you really need to um, consider the whole history of life um, as will become clear uh, if and when you read the book. So where do we even begin trying to explain diversity um, in, in given the, the, the mind boggling nature of, of the, the problem that we want to try and explain? Well, of course, the, the way we do that is we break the question down into more manageable chunks um, and we try and explain each of those chunks separately. And then what we try and do is we try and fit those chunks back together to give us a holistic view of, of how uh, systems work. Uh, and that's the classic way uh, in which ecological science uh, tries to explain diversity. So just to uh, finish up the um, with a quote from the, uh, the end of the introduction um, of the book, um, what I hope I can show you with this is that um, when we consider uh, moths, the diversity that we find in a moth trap, uh, that will help us to understand uh, how the natural world works. The contents of one small box depend on and can illuminate the workings of all of nature. So those are the rather um, substantial aims of the book. So I'll just, um, how are we doing for time? Sorry. Yeah, not too bad. So just for the rest of the talk, I will just go through and, and tell you a little bit about um, the structure of the book, uh, give you some little um, sort of snapshots into the, some of the things I talk about um, and show you how it builds chapter on chapter uh, to an understanding of um, how uh, we end up with the sort of diversity that uh, a moth trap may conjure out of thin air. So it does this across uh, 10 chapters. Um, it starts out with uh, a description, a discussion of the, of the jewel box itself, this moth trap, this amazing ecological sampling tool that um, conjures uh, incredible insect diversity out of thin air. And then I step through a whole series of chapters, each one named for and beginning with a, an individual moth um, that I catch or have caught in my moth trap, um, which help us to illustrate the different processes that, that build up to uh, generating diversity in the natural world. 
So if we start uh, just with that, with that first chapter, and, and the genesis of that was um, this particular individual moth that I caught on my very first night of moth trapping on my roof terrace in London. So for those of you that don't know, moths are Lepidoptera. Uh, Lepidoptera essentially means scale wing, and they're named for uh, these amazing little scales that they have uh, on their wings um, uh, and also over their bodies where they're often formed into hairs. Uh, and these scales can have a variety of colours, uh, and those colours together generate some really beautiful uh, patterns uh, on these insects. But those scales can also be rubbed off. Um, and if you rub the scales off a moth, as happened with this particular individual, you, you can essentially see the, the insect underneath, that hard chitinous exoskeleton that um, we're used to for beetles and, uh, uh, and flies and other insects. Uh, can be revealed if we rub the scales off and, and you can see from this particular individual that it, it's uh, it's not in the best of conditions it's lost most of its scales and given that we mainly identify uh, individual moths by the patterns uh, of color and and um, uh, and shapes on those that those scales form on their wings um, this is kind of rather an unpromising individual to try and identify uh, but it was identifiable and it was identifiable for a couple of reasons. So one is, you know, the size and the shape of it, uh, which is relatively distinct. And the other is these fantastic feathery antennae. Uh, so the this is a male. Uh, the males uh, of many species have these feathery antennae, which are essentially their uh, smelling organs. So they're using these to sense the pheromones of the female uh, and then follow that pheromone trail back to where the female is sitting and, and, and waiting for them. Uh, and this particular moth um, is a species called the gypsy moth. Uh, it's a species that has a fascinating story in the UK. Um, it was a species that uh, here was mainly found in the Fenlands of East Anglia. Um, but as those fens were drained and converted to ag agriculture, uh, the species uh, eventually dwindled to extinction in the UK um, around about the 18th century. Uh, but it's since recolonized here uh, through uh, individuals being moved in from the continent. But the gypsy moth, I think, really is, is a fantastic illustration of life superpower. And the superpower of life is that individuals can reproduce themselves. Individuals can make more individuals. And it's this fundamental um, ability that has given life its ability to uh, take a hold and spread across the whole planet and produce the amazing diversity uh, that we see around us. And as long as every individual in a population leaves on average more than one other individual, a population will grow. So probably the first organisms on the planet uh, uh, reproduced through a simple process of fission. So they would have been unicellular organisms and they would have uh, reproduced by those cells splitting into two. Uh, and each of those cells can then also split into two and so on and so forth. And this power of doubling essentially, so from one individual turning into two, into four, this power of doubling is incredibly powerful uh, in terms of uh, population increase. So uh, my colleague or one of my ex-colleagues here at, at UCL, David Colcoon, he gives the example of uh, a tap starting to drip in Wembley Stadium. So there's a tap in Wembley Stadium and as the cup final kicks off, uh, a, it, the tap drips one drop. And then after a minute, uh, it drips two drops. And after two minutes, it drips four drops. And after three minutes, it drips eight drops. And so the number of, tap, of drops coming out of this tap doubles every minute. And then the question is, how long does it take until Wembley Stadium overflows? So I guess I can't uh, see uh, hands or, or take guesses, um, but the bottom line is that Wembley Stadium would overflow before half time uh, in the cup final. Uh, it would take 44 minutes for this doubling of drips to lead to this uh, enormous stadium overflowing. Doubling is incredibly powerful. Uh, and of course, uh, most individual organisms can add more than uh, just two individuals or leave more than two offspring in the environment. Something like a gypsy moth, uh, which can lay 400 eggs, for example, can potentially leave hundreds uh, of offspring uh, every generation. And this is particularly relevant because of a, a little accident of history. So uh, this gentleman is a guy called Leopold Truvelo. Uh, Maria Popova, whose, whose work you may know, um, uh, another writer, 
uh, she says that um, Trouvelet remains best known for his exquisite astronomical illustrations. So this gentleman was um, something of a polymath in the 19th century. He was a Frenchman who went uh, to the States uh, where he was interested in all sorts of different uh, forms of science. But one thing he was interested in was uh, silk and silk production. And as part of his experiments into silk production, he took some gypsy moths from Europe where they're a native species to uh, North America, uh, to his home in Massachusetts uh, where they're not native. So this is uh, Truvelo's house, it's 27 Myrtle Street uh, in Medford. Uh, in, in either 1868 or 1869, we're not exactly sure, some of the gypsy moths that uh, Truvelo had in this house um, accidentally escaped out of the window and into his garden. And uh, this was something of a concern for him. Apparently he notified the authorities of this, although exactly what that means um, is not uh, hugely clear. Um, but the gypsy moths got into his garden and then for 20 years, essentially not much happened. Um, he, he moved on to another house, somebody else moved in. Um, but then after about 20 years, uh, pe the people of Medford suddenly started to notice that there was uh, something unusual uh, going on. And what was going on was an incredible uh, explosion in the population of gypsy moths. Uh, there was an inquiry into what exactly what had happened uh, with testimony from uh, some of the residents of the town uh, around about that time. Uh, and the testimony really is quite remarkable. So uh, Mrs. Follensby, for example, the walks, trees and fences in my yard and the sides of the house were covered with caterpillars. I used to sweep them off with a broom and burn them with kerosene. And in half an hour, they would be just as bad as ever. There were literally pecks of them. There was not a leaf on my trees. So a peck is a volume equivalent to about nine litres. Mrs. Snowden. I've seen the end of Mrs. Spinney's house so black with caterpillars that you could barely have told what colour the paint was. Mrs. Ransom. In the evening, we could hear the caterpillars eating in the trees. It sounded like the clipping of scissors. So these species, this, these caterpillars were nicknamed army worms and literally that you could see them sort of uh, advancing down the street and across from one garden to another. And they would uh, essentially strip the entire vegetation of this town um, of Medford. Uh, and here we have a, a photograph from the time of uh, people trying to uh, destroy the egg masses of this species on a tree. Um, by the time, unfortunately, the authorities realized what was going on, um, essentially the worms were out of the can and spreading too quickly for them to be contained and, and to be killed by all of the no noxious chemicals that were being sprayed around this town. Uh, and the gypsy moth now occupies more than a million square kilometers um, of northeast North America. So from uh, Leopold Truvelo's back garden in Medford through to more than a million square kilometers uh, in a little over 150 years. Uh, it doesn't uh, have high abundance in every year, but in outbreak years, it can be extremely destructive. So in 1990, for example, it, it defoliated around about 2.8 million hectares of forest. Of course, this affects the growth of the trees and forestry is a, is a very um, uh, important and valuable um, business uh, in this particular part of the world. So it just shows you uh, the incredible ability of life to uh, reproduce of populations to grow. So I start out the book just by considering how we understand this uh, this question of population growth. Uh, and essentially, uh, this builds on the fact that all individuals, all of us have two uh, features of our life um, that are invariant and given. Uh, so we are we are all born and we will all die. And exactly how um, individuals in between that um, live their lives and how they uh, reproduce and how they leave individuals in the next uh, into send individuals through into the next generation uh, then determines whether populations will grow um, and exactly how they will grow but the bottom line is if the number of births equals the number of deaths so if on average each of us leaves more than one individual uh, in the in the next gen in the next generation then a population will grow and potentially uh, will grow uh, quite dramatically, as the gypsy moth shows us. So to quote Samuel Butler, all progress is based on a, upon a universal innate desire on the part of every organism to live beyond its income. So the gypsy moth illustrates that uh, very nicely. Uh, 
But of course, no individual can uh, or no um, organism can live beyond its income. So this is as true of the human uh, species as it is of the gypsy moth. But eventually, uh, population growth will slow down and stop. Uh, and it will do that uh, essentially because we live on a finite planet. So no species has access to infinite resources. Uh, and eventually that those resources will uh, limit the growth of a population. Eventually the birth rate will decline or the death rate will increase until the population at best levels out, or if it overuses its resources, uh, the, that population will decline and crash. And of course, the reason it does that is because all animals, um, at least in this book is largely about animals, um, all animals have to consume. They have a, a supply of food. And when that food runs out, the population stop growing. So this is what I and once the population, uh, once uh, resources uh, start to become limited, then that leads to competition. It leads to competition between individuals within a species, and it can lead to competition between individuals of different species. So I illustrate that uh, with a chapter um, uh, that starts off about footmen, like this dingy footman here. So. Uh, a species of moth or a group of moths named for the fact that they look rather like the liveried servants um, of uh, the country houses uh, in Victorian England. So they have these sort of uh, look like the, the tail coats of, of the liveried footmen. Uh, footmen general in the UK are actually one of those really good news stories. So they're a, a group of organisms whose caterpillars eat lichen um, and with acid rain uh, and uh, the pollution uh, of acid rain, uh, lichens declined a lot in the UK, particularly in industrial areas, and that led to the declines and the loss of, um, of species of footmen that, um, that feed on them. As we've um, instituted clean air acts and transboundary um, regulations on the emissions of sulfur dioxide and other chemicals into the atmosphere, uh, acid rain has declined, lichens have come back, and so too have the footmen that feed on them. So species like this are, are undergoing really substantial population increases in the UK, which shows that if you give nature a chance, if you take away the, the hindrances to populations, they will bounce back and they will grow. Uh, nature can find a way. But of course, uh, even in uh, situations like this, eventually uh, there will be competition between individuals and between species. So I start out talking about footmen, but then I go on to think about some other moths. So things like the green oak tortrix and the winter moth, two species that um, compete for leaves on oak trees uh, and can even strip oaks of their leaves um, in years when uh, these species are very abundant. Uh, and also species like uh, the, the uh, cinnabar moth here, a species that feeds on ragwort. Uh, and how that can compete with uh, species that are, that are not moths. And partly this uh, this chapter also um, I think is a uh, is a good illustration of how difficult it can be to actually demonstrate the action of ecological processes. So competition is a really tough process to demonstrate, uh, and it often takes a lot of really intense and long term ecological experiments just to demonstrate that that competition uh, mm -hmm. is is happening. So populations can uh, become limited because their food runs out, but they can also become limited because they are food for uh, other organisms. So uh, I then move from competition uh, into predation and the fact that uh, there are lots of species that are out to consume other species uh, and moths are no exception. So that's illustrated by uh, this particular species, the Okega, uh, for reasons that will become apparent very shortly. But as well as attracting moths, the, the moth trap will actually attract uh, some of the predators of, of those moths as well. <laughs> So it will attract species like uh, the social wasp. So here we have a, a social wasp that barreled into uh, the moth trap one morning when I was um, emptying out the moths and jumped on this box tree moth, stung it, bit off all the appendages and then carried off the, uh, the abdomen and thorax back to the nest. Um, but also it attracts species like this. Uh, so this is a, a species of parasitoid wasp called uh, Enicospilus inflexus. Uh, and this is a species that uh, feeds exclusively on uh, oak eggers. So these parasitoids, they lay their eggs in or on uh, other insects. And when those eggs hatch out uh, into larvae, they then consume uh, those host insects essentially alive. So if you have seen the film Alien, you'll you'll know the, uh, uh, the way that these sorts of organisms work. Parasitoids are actually one of the most um, 
underrated elements of our, our natural biodiversity. There's around about 95,000 species of parasitoid wasps described worldwide, but it's thought there's probably on average maybe one parasitoid for every other insect species um, on the planet. So maybe half of all insect species are parasitoids. <laughs> the trap also brings some other larger predators, so things like this great tit here. Um, birds are major consumers of um, uh, of moths and other insects. Um, as Charles Darwin was well aware, uh, when we see things like um, birds, we, we often see the beauty and we forget that uh, these things are systematically destroying life around us. Uh, but something like a blue tit, so I, I did the sums and given how regularly um, these uh, individuals feed their broods um, at the height of a breeding season, just great and blue tits in the UK uh, will bring in something somewhere over two billion caterpillars uh, per day uh, to feed their broods. Uh, so that just go, shows to show uh, a the importance of things like moth caterpillars for food webs, uh, but also uh, just how uh, destructive uh, organisms are of other organisms. Uh, and it's this sort of consumption that can prevent populations from growing and getting out of control. So every organism is, is born, every organism dies, but how it lives its life between those, um, those bookends then determines the sorts of organism um, it, it turns out to be. And that essentially gives us the diversity of forms that we see in a moth trap. So individuals can divide the resources, the food that they, um, the energy that they um, extract from the environment, they can use that to grow, they can use it to promote their own survival and they can use it to reproduce. And exactly how they do that determines whether they live lives like the codling moth, this species here, which can cycle through several generations in a year, grows to about an inch long as a caterpillar in, in an apple, uh, very rapidly uh, it feeds up and goes down to pupate in the soil. Or things like this goat moth, uh, whose caterpillars can spend four or five years growing to maturity uh, in the heartwood of trees and then sort of grows uh, as an adult moth about the size of my thumb. Uh, but the same processes, the same fundamental rules of nature determine which these species, which uh, sort of approach to life species have. And it depends on essentially when death finds them. If you're likely to live long um, or you have a lifestyle that allows you to live long, then you can devote resources to growth uh, and survival and reproduction. Uh, which you can't if you uh, have to re reproduce quickly because you're going to die quickly. So we're starting to get an understanding for what you know limits populations, what determines population growth, the kind of different forms. Then we need to understand uh, how species, what determines how many species can live together in communities and which species. I illustrate this with a, a fantastic example. Uh, this is a, a moth called the uncertain here. Um, but these three individual moths um, that I've illustrated here are three different species, all of which uh, come to my roof terrace on Camden. So the uncertain, the vines rustic and the rustic. And it's one of the fundamental um, conundrums or really interesting questions, I think, in ecology as, as to how we can have three species that essentially look the same and essentially do more or less the same thing in, in, in an ecological community. How can these three things all live together? We often think of communities as as being structured uh, by niches. So every species has its own role in the in a community and it, a species can only exist in a community if it does something different to everything else. But perhaps actually communities are much more uh, structured by chance and, and that will then potentially allow species like these three uh, that all do more or less the same thing uh, to then coexist. Uh, but I talk about this at great length uh, in the fifth chapter on communities. What thinking about communities does tell us, though, is the importance of uh, what goes on outside communities and migration. Uh, and migration is really one of the, the um, true wonders of, of nature. Uh, and it's a it's something that we tend to think of as being particularly um, a feature of birds and bird assemblages. But actually, migration is a, is a real feature of insect assemblages, too, uh, as illustrated by this this uh, species, the silver Y. So I don't know if anyone remembers the 2016 uh, European Nations Cup final between uh, France and Portugal at the Stade de France. Uh, if you do, you may remember that um, it was 
uh, largely memorable for a, an enormous invasion of moths uh, into this stadium. So the groundskeeper had the night before left the uh, the floodlights of this stadium on overnight, uh, which coincided with a huge movement of silver wire moths. Uh, and if you go back and look at this footage, you'll see that just surfaces of this stadium are just carpeted in this moths on the uh, the the goalie had them on him the the goal posts had them the corner flags and one even landed on uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's um, eyebrow as he was waiting to be stretched off injured um, in the first half and things like the silver wire are really remarkable so it's a weight of a large raindrop it's quite a large moth but it's not a big organism uh, and yet it can fly up uh, to around about 100 metres and it can uh, head off south uh, in autumn and it can cruise at around 40 to 50 kilometres an hour. So over the course of an autumn night it can cover uh, maybe 600 kilometres and it can go from the south of uh, England to the south of France where it might pass the winter uh, in around about three nights. And something like the silver wire, if it's had a good breeding season, then maybe 700 million um, of these insects might cross the channel uh, from the UK heading south uh, in autumn. Quite remarkable. Uh, and they're not alone. There's lots of other insects that migrate as well. So it's been estimated that somewhere in the region of three trillion insects are annually migrating um, north and then south over just the, the, the area of southern England and Wales. So just a relatively small part of the UK. In terms of biomass, that equates to around about just over 3,000 tonnes of insect biomass sort of flying around above our heads, um, of which around about 225 tonnes is what we might call large insects like the silver wire. So most of the insects are relatively small things like aphids and they're like, uh, but large insects, um, still many uh, millions of those flying around above us. And just for comparison, all of those lovely summer migrant songbirds that uh, that we think about are nightingales and our warblers and our swallows and so on. Uh, we have around 415 tonnes of those uh, coming to the UK every summer. So insects, migratory insects, are an incredible feature of biodiversity. Thinking about migrants and how they contribute to the structure of communities then meet, leads us on to thinking about uh, the environment more widely. So why is it that some areas have uh, more species in the environment than others? And this leads us onto the process of the birth and death of species and diversification, uh, speciation and extinction. Uh, and it's essentially building out our picture. So to think about the moths on a roof terrace in Camden, we have to start about thinking about what's beyond that wider community. And that ends up with us thinking about the whole process of the birth and death of species over the millions of years, the 300 million years or so in the case of moths, uh, that these things have been existing on the planet and diversifying. And then because no book uh, these days can uh, finish without some consideration of um, how the world is changing, uh, I finish up by considering this new uh, player on the scene, this organism that's inserting itself into all of these ecological processes that I've talked about uh, as generating natural diversity and how uh, that player is changing these processes with uh, potentially catastrophic effects for uh, natural diversity. Uh, and that pl pl player, of course, is us. And because we have such good records of moth populations in the UK because of um, obsessive moth trappers like me who have been doing this for many decades, uh, we can actually look at uh, how uh, moth populations have changed over time. And since 1970, uh, we reckon there's probably been about a 33% decline in the uh, the numbers of uh, moths in the UK. Um, and it's not like 1970 was a high point of, of moth uh, biodiversity. So it's reckoned that in the 1970s, there were probably about seven, already about 70% fewer moths than in the 1930s. So we're seeing year on year, decade on decade declines in biodiversity, uh, all because of the various impacts that humans have uh, on the various ecological processes uh, that generate uh, natural diversity. Uh, and then I just finish up um, with a little overview, a summary and a, and a look to the future. As H.E. Wells said, uh, Homo sapiens is no privileged exception to the general conditions that determine the destinies of other living species. We all live on a finite planet uh, and we are all subject to the same uh, processes um, that influence birth and death uh, as every other species. And I finish up with this little moth, uh, this little micro moth, because um, it's, this is a really nice um, species, I think, from, from my perspective. 
So this is a, oops, this is a species that when I started moth trapping uh, didn't even exist. Uh, it's a species that only was described in 2017. Uh, it is uh, an alien. Uh, it's um, a species uh, that I catch on my roof terrace uh, in London, um, but was only described in, in the last um, few years. Uh, and I think this is a really great illustration that, um, you know, there is it, all this incredible unseen diversity, biodiversity living around us. Um, we don't see it. Uh, but it's there uh, and if we pay attention to it then I think um, our lives will be enriched um, and hopefully uh, would also help us to uh, maybe save some of this biodiversity going forward. So thank you very much for your attention um, and I will be very pleased uh, to answer questions if there are some. Thank you Jim, that was, that was... oh sorry can you hear me now? Yeah uh, yes yes. Sorry. Yeah, okay, great. And thank you. That was amazing. Uh, we still stopped to go to really um, a part of the world that we don't see, uh, partly because uh, many of us are not nocturnal. <laughs> um, I'll start with a question from Tamil Vanan. I'll rephrase it. Um, is there, what are the ecological drivers that would have pushed moths to turn nocturnal? <clears throat> Sorry. So that's that's a very good question. Um, so the first thing to say is that um, although most moths are nocturnal, uh, many moths aren't nocturnal. Uh, so obviously all the butterflies are, are diurnal. Uh, in the UK, we have more di um, diurnal moth species than there are butterflies. So, you know, it's not an unsub unsubstantial um, part of biodiversity. But I suspect that as, as with many things, it's just the imperative to not be eaten. So what you see written on the, the bodies of moths um, at all of their life stages really is um, adaptations to uh, avoid being eaten. So sort of many of the caterpillars, you know, look like sticks. They're essentially, they uh, will burrow between leaves to avoid being seen. Um, some of them are brightly colored because they um, absorb the toxins of their plants um, and they are brightly colored to show that they're noxious. Um, but I strongly suspect that um, that predation and things that eat them is is one reason why they um, they started flying around um, in the dark. Of course, um, that's just given opportunities for nocturnal species to uh, to prey on them. Uh, but then we also see adaptations to to try and avoid uh, those species as well. So there's some fantastic arms races between uh, bats uh, as classic nocturnal predators of moths and the moths themselves to to try and reduce the predation. Yeah, the eternal war, um, which make for so many good scientific papers. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, I really love the structure of your talk. Um, I would say it's hard to tell. Do you like football? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I do, but I mean that that game was particularly dull. Uh, it was it was only the moths that really uh, enlivened that. One. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah. Vincent Smith asks: Is it true that LED streetlights don't attract moths? Uh, it depends on the wavelength. So um, moths kind of are more attracted to um, sort of the blue spectrum and the UV spectrum. So actually, um, if you put in lights that have a wider spectrum of light emitting, so the ones that tend to be that look whiter to us can be more attractive to moths. So relative to things like sodium lights, for example, that that that. Um, so if there's if you're more towards the red end of the spectrum, they tend to uh, um, attract attract fewer. But the great thing about LEDs is that it's it's much easier than it is for other things to tweak the um, the output of those bulbs. So it is possible um, to um, manipulate them to be less attractive to uh, insects like moths, and also to be less bright and energy emitting as well. Um. Trevor Clark asks, um, I, there are many of these apps around now for identification, like the Merlin app for birds and iNaturalist. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. for moths or would you recommend anything for IDing? Yeah. So one I use is um, there's, a, there's a fantastic app called OBS Identify. So I will always say that with an app like that, so that's not the end point of the identification. It's the starting point of the identification. So I would I would view it. So scientifically, I would view its suggestion for an identification as a hypothesis to be proven 
rather than the end of the identification process. So for macro moths, the, the, the big ones, um, it's generally pretty good, um, but it does still get things wrong. And there are situations where, you know, it will say, well, it's, you know, it's 40 percent this moth and it's 30 percent a European otter. Or, you know, so it, it can make mistakes. But certainly if you're getting into um, identifying moths, it's it's a really good place to start because often it will, um, if it doesn't get it right, it will take you to sort of the broad group of moths that you need to um, to distinguish between. I have this question as well, and it's from Ian Tuff. What's the most surprising find in your moth trap? Um, so I, I guess there's two two ends of the, the spectrum, really. So one is is um, this lovely little micro moth that I catch in Camden, uh, which is it's a species um, called Praise Peregrina. And it's a species that was actually first discovered by scientists on Hampstead Heath, uh, which is just near where I live. Uh, it's an alien species. Nobody knows where it, it originally comes from. Um, it was described on the basis of of individuals caught on Hampstead Heath and I catch it in my moth trap. And so that is just incredible because it's a species we we don't know where it's from. We, we know almost nothing about it, but nevertheless, it, it's, um, it lives there. At the other end of the spectrum, I, I take a field course to Blakeney Point for, for master students. And last year, um, I opened the moth trap up there and there was a death's head hawk moth um, in the trap. Um, and I think I say in the book that I dream of opening the trap and seeing a death's head hawk moth and a couple of years after writing that 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 dream came true for, for those of you that don't know it's it's you know it's one of the biggest moths that we have in the uk it's sort of about this sort of size uh the markings are, are stunning and also it um it squeaks like a mouse so if you if you annoy it if you poke it it will squeak uh and it's just quite incredible i mean i honestly that that was one of the best days of my life uh, we, we spent most of the day just like you know carrying this thing around and looking at it and <laughs> stroking it and yeah it was just incredible yeah yeah all of the squeak might turn a few yeah. people <laughs> off, off I think because I think many people are you know because moths are kind of like slow flying and they kind of tend to sit on you which kind of freaks people out a bit and yeah. uh, I think a squeak might be a bit too hard <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, Helen asked, is there evidence of founder effects uh, in the genetics of gypsy moths in North America? I'm not sure if that's in your realm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure it's ever been looked at, to be honest. I mean, given, so I don't know, um, and I'm not sure if anyone knows whether that founding effect was eggs or adults or caterpillars or what it was. And I don't think anyone knows how many individuals uh, got out into the the population i'd have thought that you know if there were you know fewer than 20 animals involved then you ought to be able to see founder effects but i think so my work on aliens suggest well not my work but work on aliens suggests that actually you know even relatively small numbers of individuals can found populations and those founder effects often um sort of uh, don't last or they're, they're not always apparent as, as you might think they they ought to be given that you know the small numbers involved i don't know the answer for the gypsy moth though it's a good question I guess. um christopher asks if moth traps kill all the moths that enter them should we be discouraging the use of these traps by anybody except specialists ologists people studying them uh, i should have said they don't kill them so the moths uh, yeah. uh, they're alive they're fine they, they sort of they get a bit confused they sit in the trap you go out the next morning um and then you can let them go so uh, you have to be a bit careful and sort of put them in places where the birds uh, can't necessarily find them and the birds very quickly learn if, if you're moth trapping at a place for uh, more than a few nights they they learn that um, they can go down the next morning and get a, a free meal um but no the trap the traps don't kill the moths they're perfectly fine and they will fly off um and sometimes turn up again the next day or um, or just disappear and go on with their own lives I, I yeah I wouldn't be doing this if I was killing all of those animals no I mean this is not the 17th 18th century where we're shooting birds um, <laughs> no. everywhere um Charlotte asked do you have any advice on reducing or eliminating bycatch uh I think Charlotte uh has a moth trap 
Um, but she has had lots of shield bugs and lace wings. Um, is it wise to reduce the amount of time that is out for? Um, so I, I guess less time you'll catch less things, but I don't think there's much you can do to eliminate the, the bycatch really. Um, all sorts of insects are, are attracted by light. I will say, I, I mean, I, I think the bycatch is often as interesting as, as the moths themselves, unless you happen to put the trap out near a hornet's nest and you <laughs> you find yourself uh, surrounded by hornets, uh, which has never happened to, I occasionally get one in the trap in the morning, but um, I have had friends who basically they just had to pack up, you know, after half an hour or, or whatever, because yeah, they're sort of just being surrounded by hornets, which is very far from ideal. And it's it's far from ideal for the moths as well, because the hornets uh, will will predate the, uh, the the moths that you catch. Um, but yeah, I have no tips on reducing bycatch. And I think, yeah, that, that's almost as interesting as the moths themselves. Yeah, I guess if it's not harming them in any way, then it, it might be all right. Um, yeah. Do you have a recommendation for a beginner moth trap? I think a lot of people, a lot of attendees are interested in yeah trying out yeah i should be on commission really um <laughs> so so it, uh, there is a uh, a website anglian lepidoptera supplies um it's a good place to go and see the sort of the diversity of moth traps you can get so um i just essentially got um an entry level skinner trap so it was just the cheapest moth trap they had on their site um i have friends that have made their own moth trap so if you get a, a fluorescent bulb and like a, a a bulb holder and a a box you can essentially make your own i'm just really incompetent when it comes to um diy and that sort of thing so i much rather uh, just sort of purchase an off-the-shelf thing um but if you go to a anglin leopard option supplies you can see the range of things that um and the sort of styles and um any of the traps um will um, will catch things uh, so people tend to start out small and then obviously as they get obsessed get bigger and bigger so the the, the sorts of the traps I run and particularly in Camden it has like a 20 watt uh, fluorescent bulb you can get some that have 125 watt mercury vapor bulbs and they attract more moths um, but I live in a flat um, <laughs> in, a, in a terrace block in Camden and I think if I was running 125 um, watt mercury vapor bulb on my roof terrace i, I would have um, got booted out by the neighbors i'd be attracting other nocturnal beings which you would not want to <laughs> um yeah i mean this is not encourage encouragement to build a lighthouse on your flat <laughs> um i'll get to a couple of the last questions uh, ray heaton has asked do you think the urban environment is a sanctuary from intensive agricultural practice hence you know you're really full jewel box so I would say um, I tend to catch more moths anywhere other than London. So even though I do catch things in London, um, I would always rather be catching uh, trapping in the countryside. So in general, the more habitat there is around, the better. Um, obviously, there are big issues with um, agriculture intensification and particularly pesticide application. Um, but in London, you have to trade that off against the fact that most of the surfaces in London are not conducive to growing moths. So brick and asphalt and concrete won't produce moths. Um, but having said that, you know, there are special things you get it in London. And um, I'm not sure that's necessarily an effect of cities per se. It's probably more an effect of the fact that we're in the southeast. And as moths colonize from the continent, they sort of tend to spread through the southeast. And, and we catch things in London that you don't necessarily catch in other parts of the country. Um, but I, I don't think that there's um, I don't, anything to be said for, for cities as a sanctuary for moths, unfortunately. And Norma Jean, uh, I think, echoes our thoughts as well when she says, great research and can't wait to read your book. And where can it be purchased? Um, I think, Tim, you can send us a link and I can send it across to our attendees. Uh, is it available in the U.S.? It's available in the US, okay. um, um, but I mean, all of the all of the standard places you would expect to find books, uh, you can get it. So Waterstones have it, Amazon has it, um, books.org um, have it. You can get it in all of those places. If you go online, it's really easy to find. Or even in a real bookshop. 
<laughs> yeah, I imagine that. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. This was excellent. And thank you for the fantastic photos and um, the journey through moths. Maybe a next book on football and moth similes. Um, <laughs> we got a lot of those. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended. And thanks to Anna Perman for joining us today evening as well. And we'll be in touch, Tim. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.